I said, hopefully everybody got Sunday afternoon naps in. If you missed out, maybe you'll get one in later. Uh, our hymn tonight is going to be 436, Whiter Than Snow. Four thirty six. Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want thee forever to live in my soul. Break down every idol, cast out every foe. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, look down for your throne in the skies. And help me to make a complete sacrifice. I give up myself and whatever I know. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, for this I most humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing I see your blood flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord Jesus, before you I patiently wait. Come now and within me a new heart create. To those you have sought you, you never said no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Brother Mike. Good evening. It's good to be back with you. I did get to go and have lunch and take a nap. <laughs> Somebody's already told me their nap wasn't long enough. <laughs> Mine was just right. I want you to know I really appreciate the offering that y'all gave this morning. I don't know if y'all heard what it was or not, but... Uh, 
the love offering you gave this morning to the Gideons was uh, $1,247. So, praise the Lord. I said, yeah, go ahead and give yourself a hand. <laughs> That's a lot of Bibles right there that we're going to be able to place in outstretched hands around the world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, it is. So I praise the Lord for that and praise the Lord for you and praise the Lord for the opportunity to be back here tonight. <clears throat> now, I've got a sermon tonight the Holy Spirit gave me. I've been praying all week on what it was he wanted me to talk about, and he gave me this sermon, and I don't know exactly why he gave it to me because I said, you know, I'm going to be preaching to the choir. <laughs> I said, the people, that, the people that are really sold out Christians are the ones that come back at night, you know, to hear the sermon at night. But I also found out that I didn't know. I didn't know that y'all recorded these, and then it went out over the Internet. So, I, you know, maybe the sermon that the Holy Spirit gave me tonight is for something or someone out there that they're going to hear on the Internet. But it, 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 it is a sermon that, uh, you know, sometimes when you sit down and you pray for the Lord to give you something, and you sit down and you start writing and it seems like everything just flows right out of the end of that pen and it just never stops. And that's the way this sermon was when I sat down and started writing it. The title of the sermon tonight I've got is Standing Up, One-on-One -on -one with God. And I think one of the reasons that I, I got this sermon from the Holy Spirit is because of what's happening in our world today. How that, you know, the... The world and, and uh, the corrupt government that we have is just keep continually just gradually taking things away from the church. And so my sermon tonight is a little bit about that. Uh, my first text that I'm going to read tonight is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. <clears throat> it says, For God is working in you giving you the desire to obey him, the power to do what pleases him. In everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing, so that one can speak, so that no one can speak a word of blame against you. You are to live clean, innocent lives as children of God in a dark world full of crooked and perverse people. Now this was written almost two thousand years ago. But it sounds like it was written last week, doesn't it? <laughs> but it says, we are among, among in a dark world full of crooked and perverse people. Let your light shine brightly before them. Amen. Let your light shine brightly before them. You know, the Bible is filled with great examples of faith. People with a lot of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, of course, is known as the faith chapter, gives us a, a display of many of these people in the Bible that had so much faith. Because of their faith, we have many examples of people in the Bible who were willing to, to, to stand up uh, against insurmountable odds because of their faith in God. You know... You know, I guess the first one that enters your mind when you think about that is David versus Goliath. You know, here's this little shepherd boy standing up against a giant with a spear and a shield, and all he had was some stones and a slingshot. But because of his faith in God, he knew that he was going to be successful. You know, there's one man in the Bible that was an extraordinary man. He was one of the, one of the greatest men in all the Bible. He stood on Mount Carmel. And with a 30-second, a 30-second prayer, he called down fire from heaven and proved to a nation beyond a shadow of a doubt that Yahweh God was the one true God in the land, not only in the land, but in the, in the world, in the universe. His name is Elijah. Elijah was a patient man because God sent him out into the wilderness to hear from him. Elijah was discouraged, and God sent him out into the wilderness. He said, I'm sending you to a brook. And now I've even got a sermon on that called A Place Called There. But he sent him to that brook because he would know that he had water to drink. And then God took care of him and sustained him by, through the help of a raven. 
When the sun got too hot, he even had a broom tree to grow right there to give him a little shade. So Elijah waited patiently, you know, before all of this happened where he brought fire down from heaven. He waited patiently there at the brook and allowed God to sustain him in that wilderness with the help of a raven. You know, Elijah saw many great miracles of God throughout of his life, but he was human just like you and me. Because he was human, Elijah got tired. He got worn out. He got discouraged. He got frightened. He even got despondent. As a matter of fact, while he was in the wilderness resting there underneath the shade of that broom tree, he actually asked God to let him die. He said, I'm fed up, God. I'm tired of fighting all these crazy people. Why don't you just let me die? I'm the only prophet left, and this little old me, I, I don't know what I can do, so just take my life. Well, you know, I don't know. Elijah said several times that he was the only prophet left, but you know that wasn't true, and God told him it wasn't true. He said, I've got 7,000 people that haven't bowed down to Baal. You're not the only prophet prophet left but he said just take my life he was totally despondent and in his in his discouragement his complete emptiness and the dr just drained the energy out of his body Elijah just laid down and went to sleep well God sent an angel to wake him up the angel came to Elijah and said wake up Elijah get up and eat and sure enough when Elijah woke up and rubbed his eyes he looked there and there was some bread that had been baked on the hot rocks out in the desert. Do you remember when you were a child and you used to go barefooted and you go outside and if you got on a pavement or on the sidewalk, they'd burn your feet and you'd say, man, you could fry an egg on this thing out here. Well, that's the way those rocks were out there in the wilderness. They were so hot that the angel baked bread on those hot rocks. And he had a glass, he had a jar of water there for Elijah too. So Elijah got up and he ate and he drank the water. And just like I did today when I ate my lunch, guess what? I felt like I needed to take a little siesta. And so Elijah decided he was going to go back to sleep again. The angel said, oh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, you're not going to go back to sleep, Elijah. You get up. He said, God's not through with you yet. You need to get up. We got things for you to do. And so uh, he said, eat again. So Elijah got up and he ate again. And then the angel said, okay, now you're going on a long journey. And Elijah went out into the wilderness and wandered around in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights on that meal that he had that the angel fixed for him. Wow, wouldn't it be great if God had given us that recipe? <laughs> Wouldn't it be great that we could fix us a meal from that recipe and we could be sustained for 40 days and 40 nights and not have to eat again? I mean, with the price of groceries the way they are today, that would definitely be a blessing. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting about the number 40. For some reason, that was, it, it meant something to God and it had high significance in the Bible. Elijah roamed around in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Do you remember that when God decided to destroy the earth, to get rid of all the sinful people, how long did it rain? 40 days and 40 nights. You know, when Moses uh, interceded for the Israelites because of their sin before God and God was very angry with them, guess what? Moses interceded for them for 40 days and 40 nights. When the spies were sent into Canaan to spy out the Canaan land, guess how long they were there? 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> when Goliath taunted the Israeli army for 40 days and 40 nights before little David showed up and, and took care of business. Then in the New Testament, Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. Isn't that interesting? 40 days and 40 nights. Now we can go to Moses now and look at the number 40. When Moses was born and his mother put him in a little basket and he was basically adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, guess how long he was in Egypt? 
being growing up and being taught all he needed to be taught, learning how to fight battles. He was a, big, a great warrior for Egypt. God had him there teaching him all the things he needed to know when he had to come back and face his enemy, which was Egypt. Guess how long he was there in Egypt? Forty years. When he killed the, the Egyptian soldier and he was afraid he was going to be found out, he ran into the wilderness and he met his future father-in-law. And guess how long he lived in the wilderness? Forty years. And that's when he, of course, went up to Mount Horeb and met God at the burning bush and received his commission. And then when God called him and sent him back to Egypt, guess how long it took him to get back to the land of Canaan? Forty years. That's 120 years and three 40-year increments. So, I, you know, I don't know why that 40 is such an, an intriguing number to God. Maybe God discerned that that's how long it took for him to get the message to us or what he was trying to do. I don't know. Maybe it took that long to get it into our hard head and get it into our hearts so it could, could become a passion that we wanted to accomplish. You know, Elijah did wander around in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights until he finally arrived at his next God-appointed destination. And that was on Mount Sinai, but back when he went there the first time, if you read in 1 Kings chapter 19, 8, it says he came to Mount Horeb, H-O-R-E-B, known as the Mount of God, the very mount where Moses met God in the burning bush and received his commission. This is the same mount where he, Moses, through God, watered, brought water from the rock to sustain the pit children of Israel. It's also the mount where the people stripped off their jewelry and ornaments in a token of repentance before God for their sins. It was a mountain that was to the people synonymous with a holy God. It was a holy mountain. Well, guess what? That same mountain became known as Mount Sinai, and when Moses came back to that mountain, that's what it was, Mount Sinai, and it's the same mountain as Mount Horeb, and that's where he met God again and where God gave him the Ten Commandments. Now, Elijah was a man called of God. He was called of him to stand, to confront, to confront, not comfort, he was to stand and confront, not bow down, not yield to the demands of the powers to be at that particular time. He was called to stand against the corrupt desires of the world, and the world was very corrupt then. Elijah did stand, and he even stood against the king of that day, Ahab, and also against the king's wife, Jezebel, and her 450 prophets of Baal. There was 450 prophets of Baal that dined at Jezebel's table every day. She also had 400 prophets of Asherah. So that's 850 false prophets that Jezebel fed and took care of. Now, Ahab and Jezebel had encouraged all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah to tear down all of the altars of God and to replace them with shrines to Baal or with altars to Baal. So Elijah called all those 850 prophets, false prophets, he called them and challenged them sort of to a duel, so to speak. You know how we watch these old Western movies and they would challenge each other to duel and go out in the street and shoot it out? And I, I think the movie I remember more than anything was High Noon. Where they <laughs> well, that's sort of what Elijah did. He called the prophets of Baal out to a duel. And he, he had them gather at Mount Carmel. And Elijah said to the people, well, until me, and instead of I, me telling you what he said to the people, I'm going to turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. And sort of look at, start at verse 21, and I'm not going to read all these verses because it would be here a lot, a lot longer if I did. I'm sort of going to hit the high spots. But Elijah called the prophets together and said, okay, he said to the people, he turned to the people, he said, how long y'all going to waver between these, these two, you know, these two gods? I mean, is Baal the God that you want to worship? Or is Jehovah the God you want to worship? He said, we need to get this straightened out right here and now. 
So he told the, the prophets of Baal, he said, all of y'all get together and said, we're going to bring two bulls in here, and you choose whichever one you want. It doesn't make any difference to me. You choose whatever bull you want to sacrifice to your God, and I'll take the other one that's left. You build your altar, you put wood on your altar, and you cut up your bull and put, your, put the, it on top of the wood, and then you pray to your God and, and see if he will receive your sacrifice. But don't set fire to the wood. He said, I'm going to build my altar to Jehovah God. And he said, and I'm going to put wood on it, and I'm going to cut up my bull and put the pieces of meat on top of that, and I'm going to pray to Jehovah God and ask him to receive the sacrifice. He said, the God that sets the wood on fire and receives the sacrifice will be the one true God. And the people say, hey, that sounds pretty good. That's logical. So they all agree. So Elijah said, okay, there's 450 of you prophets of Baal, 400 of you prophets of Asherah. There's a whole lot more of you than me, so y'all go first. So y'all just go ahead and build your offer and cut your meat up, and y'all offer it to your God. So they did. And then they started praying to their God. Oh, Baal, listen to our prayer. Oh, Baal, accept this sacrifice. And they did that all morning. And Baal never answered. And so they started dancing around and screaming, and he never answered. They got jumped up on the altar and, and jumped and screamed, and he never answered. <laughs> and about noon, Elijah started mocking them. And he said, you know, surely this Baal is a god. You said he's a god, so maybe you just need to shout louder. So they started shouting louder, and they started cutting themselves with knives and, and, and swords until blood gushed. And, and Elijah just kept mocking them and said, well, maybe, you know, maybe he's, um, he's meditating, and he just can't hear you. Shout louder. And they started shouting louder. And he said, well, maybe he's just out relieving himself. Maybe he's just sound asleep, and, you, and he just can't hear you. Shout loud. And they did that until the sun almost went down till it was time when the Jews normally made their sacrifice to God. But Baal had never answered. He had never accepted that sacrifice. So Elijah said, okay, guys, y'all come over here. So all the people came and gathered around his altar. And you know, I told you that Ahab and Jezebel had, uh, had uh, the prophets of Baal to tear down the altars of God. So Elijah had to rebuild the altar. And he took 12 stones that were torn down and made them stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel and rebuilt that altar. And he cut the, cut the wood and put it on there and he put the, the offering, the meat, the bull, the bull on top of that. And then he walked up and he prayed to God. And this is what he said. He said, O oh Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all of this at your command. O oh Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. As soon as he ended that prayer, that 30-second prayer, immediately fire came from heaven. Fire came from heaven and lit not only the wood and burned the wood, but it consumed the wood, it consumed the meat, it consumed the stones, it consumed the dust around the stones. Oh, I left out something. What did I leave out? Water. When he built that altar and put the, the, meat, the uh, wood up there and the meat up there, he said, Bring four jars of water, big stone jars, probably like the ones that Jesus turned the water to wine. And he said, pour all four stone jars of water over the meat, the wood, the altar, and everything. And they did. And he said, fill them up and do it again. And they did. And when he said, do it a third time. And they did, and water was just all over that, and they had dug a trench around that altar, and that trench was full of water and overflowing with water. And when that fire from heaven came down and consumed everything there, then it licked up the water out of the trench. When the people saw that, what do you think they did? <laughs> they fell on their face, and they started shouting, shouting, oh, 
God, Lord God, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. And then Elijah told the people, surround all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah and don't let one of them escape. And so all the people surrounded them and didn't let them escape. And then Elijah took them down to the valley of the Kishon Valley and killed every one of them. All 850 prophets died that day. Well, what a victory. What a victory. What an awesome display of God's power. But then what happened next? Well, when Ahab went home to Jezebel and told Jezebel what Elijah had done to her prophets, she sent Elijah a message. And in that message, she said, you know, she said, the same thing that you did to my prophets is going to happen to you by about this time tomorrow. Now, if Jezebel could have killed Elijah, she would have sent soldiers that day to kill him. But she knew she couldn't because the people had returned to God. They had surrounded all her prophets. They're the ones that took them down and to the valley to let Elijah kill them. She knew that they would rebel against her too. So she was just sending a threat to scare Elijah. Guess what? It worked. When Elijah got the message and he heard what Jezebel said, that she was going to have him kill by that time tomorrow, did he stand upon the miraculous victory that he had just won over all the prophets of Baal? No. Did he stand up in faith upon the miraculous display of God's power that he had just seen? No. He let one woman put the fear in his heart and he ran like a scared rabbit. People, God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us the spirit of courage, the spirit of standing strong on His promises, the spirit of standing against all odds, even a woman scorned. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe we have that kind of power? If you do, then here's a question, and I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight, but why are we Christians now bowing to the evil powers that be today? Why are we letting the world and the government tell us what we can do and what we can't do, when we can worship and when we can't worship, when we can pray and when we cannot pray, where God is welcome and where God is not welcome. Where we can pass out the scriptures and where we can't pass out the word of God. The body of Christ, the church, must stop being passive. And that's the way we've been across this country. We sit around and let the government take our liberties away. We've got to stop being passive. We've got to stand up and call sin, sin. We need to stop sitting on our hands and letting corrupt government and Satan and his followers control the media, control the college campuses, control the self-centered me generation, control the if it feels good, I have a right to do it mentality, Control and take our country away from us. We Christians need to stand and take our country back. Take it back to its Judeo-Christian principles. Stop the false prophets of greed, of money-loving, of power, and plunging this country into the abyss of hell. Because that's what they're doing to it. That is what they're doing to it. You know, a comprehensive demographic study was done several years ago. 
In that study, they went to 200 countries around the world. That's really not 200 countries, so it'd be 200 countries and territories around the world. Do you know they found out in that study that 2.18 billion, that's billion, not million, billion people claim to be Christians, claim to be followers of Christ. That was nearly a third of the entire world population at the time that this, t this study was taken. Now, granted, some of those people that claim to be Christians, probably some of them didn't even know what a Christian was. But even with an astronomical number like 2.18 billion, even with, with some of the false answers that were given, I honestly believe that if those who are really Christians were to take their heads out of the sand and start communicating with one another and start, start uniting as a unit and vote as a unit, that we could change this country overnight. I mean, 2.18 billion people. If we would vote the Bible and not vote politics, not vote brand names like Democrat or Republican or Independent, and, uh, of course not, not Socialism, if we would vote what God says in His Word we could change the direction of this entire world, not just the United States of America. You know, if 2.18 billion people, or, or whatever number it is that it really are Christians, if they all stood together and stopped trading with companies that blatantly support homosexual agenda, those people that unabashedly claim to want to wipe Israel off of the face of the earth along with the United States of America? Do you not know, without a doubt, that we could change things overnight? Everything the world does is based on greed, based on money and the love of money and on the power that it gives them. If a large enough group of Christians were to take a large enough flow of that money away from their caulkers, their tune, their attitude would change drastically. But it has to be done united. If we could unite and vote the Bible, we could rid D.C. of all the corrupt politicians they have up there as well as the corrupt politicians that we have in our own local governments. We Christians over the years have sat back and acted like the complacent toad. That's what I said, toad, frog. You know the old story about the toad, the frog? If you take that toad and drop it into a pot of hot water, because of his strong legs, as soon as he hit that wa hot water, he'd jump right out of that pot and save his life. But if you take that same toad and place it in a pot of just room temperature water that feels good to him, he's going to sit there and enjoy it. And he's not going to feel threatened. Then you can start turning up the heat just a little bit at a time. Turn it up again just a little bit. You can keep doing that, and that idiot frog will sit there until you boil him to death. He will not jump out, even though he has the legs to do it. Well, unfortunately, we Christians have allowed the government, the media, the pleasure-hungry world gradually strip this country of its religious heritage, gradually, a little bit at a time, and we're still sitting in the pot. We have allowed these people to strip us of God's centered values on His Word. Strip us of the values that was established in this country over 200 years ago. Strip us of the values that is written in our Constitution that is now being whitewashed right off the pages. 
When are we as Christians going to wake up? When are we going to stand up? Stand up to the powers to be like Elijah did. To demand our government and our country return to the Christian principles, to God's word. When are our preachers and our churches going to stop being afraid to preach to our congregations, to preach out on the streets if we need to, that we are to obey God and not man? We are to vote what God says is right, not to vote what the world says is politically correct. Amen? Amen. You may cry out right now, well, you know, we, we, we just don't have the right to tell people how to vote. Well, you better wake up because they're telling us how to vote and they're even th- making threats to us and we don't vote their way. You know, we need to be telling these people something different than what they're hearing, which is contrary to the Word of God. You know, if we are really and truly God-fearing believers, if we're really haters of sin, haters of murdering babies, haters of having homosexuality forced upon us daily and portrayed on our TVs daily, isn't it? Isn't it terrible that you can be watching TV and you have an advertisement and you look up and you got two men kissing each other? If you want your Judeo-Christian country back, you better start speaking up, standing up, telling the world we're not going to lay down and take it anymore. We're going to start demanding you take this filth off of the TV. We can't afford to just... Lay back and turn a deaf ear to what's going on anymore. We can't, afford, we, we can't afford to listen to all these things. That, well, we just can't offend anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Well, let me tell you, they're stomping all over ours. Stomping all over ours. We need to get out of that come by y'all feeling. And we're going to come by y'all this country straight to hell. You know, Elijah, when he heard what Jezebel had to say and put fear in his heart and he ran away, he actually hid in a cave. God came and called him out of that cave. You know what God said to him? He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And God said, I mean, Elijah said, oh, I'm the lone prophet left. It's just little old me. I've tried to serve you and I've tried to do all the things, but you know, it's just me. I just can't do it anymore. God said, you're not the only prophet left, and I've got things to do for you. God called him out of that cave. God gave him the strength to get straightened out. God gave him the strength to do what he was called to do. Well, you know what? We Christians, as a, as a body of Christ, have been sitting back and letting the world slip away from us. We've been sort of like hiding in a cave ourselves. We don't want God coming to Suffer Springs or Hubman Baptist Church and say, what are you doing here? How come you're not standing up for me? How come you're not standing up for my word, for the truth? Why aren't you, why aren't you standing up for the God-fearing company, country I established for you over 200 years ago? Why aren't you standing up for the, for the Constitution that I had you write that is being whitewashed? Why aren't you standing up against this corruption that's before us? God brought Elijah out of the cave, gave him the strength to stand up again. He actually gave him the strength to outrun a horse-grown chariot. You know what? God is calling his church out of the cave. God is telling us, hey, I've given you the power of the Holy Spirit. I've given you the power of the Holy Spirit to stand up, to stand up to the corruption of the government, to stand up to the corruption in the evil media, to stand up to all of these people that are taking your Christian heritage away from you, the evil politicians, the greed, self-pleasing people who care nothing about themselves. Stand up. Get outside these walls, God is saying. Carry the torch of truth, God's very word, back into the halls of Congress. Carry the truth, the torch of God's word, back into the schools, 
back into the highways and the byways, carry the torch out into the dark world and cause the rats to scurry back into their holes. That's a rise, church. Let's be the restored Elijah that walked with God, that regained his faith. He regained his strength and then rode the fiery chariot right into heaven, into the arms of God Almighty. Arise, church, and be the light of Jesus to that dark world out there. Let us pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come very humble. We come asking for forgiveness, Father, for being complacent, for being self-satisfied, for sitting back, Father, and letting the corruption of this world overtake us to the point that we are almost boiling to death. Help us, Father. Help us as individuals. Help us as a church, the body of Christ, to stand up for you, to stand up and say no to the corruption of this world, to say no to the government when they tell us we can't come together and worship. Help us, Father, to listen to you and not to the world. Help us to be the example to everyone out there that we worship God and none other. Forgive us when we fail you, Father, but give us the courage to do what you instruct us to do. Lead us and guide us in all that we do so that we might be honor and glory to you. For I ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Are, are, are you going to sing?